I am uh, real appreciative that everybody came to I want to thank you all. And um, Art, that's for you too. That's a, <laughs> yeah, I wish. But I'm seriously, I want to thank all you guys for coming. You know, it's really great because this is International Fight Week. And uh, I was at a Tough Enough event last night over at Texas Station Gambling Hall and Casino. And uh, I'm talking to somebody from Ireland. Charlie Anselmo had a promoter there from Australia. And you know, when you think about it, my God, from Bangkok to Oslo today, MMA is here. You know, whether it's in Beijing or it's in Brooklyn, uh, MMA has really arrived. You know, was I prescient 21 years ago? Hey, other than soccer, the martial arts is the one thing that young people did all over the planet Earth. Uh, you know, every country you went into, whether it was Penjak Salat in Indonesia, whether it was Bando, Bando in Burma, whether it was Kendo or Judo or Jiu-Jitsu in Japan, everybody was into the martial arts. All I was bright enough to do was to figure out a way to package it into a franchise. And, you know, we've been rocking and rolling ever since. So the reason for the book, pretty simple. Number one, I wanted to remind everybody that the most important event in MMA history was the first event. Because if it didn't work, if we didn't do it, or if it had flopped, we wouldn't be sitting here today talking, and I wouldn't be. I'd, I'd be selling you know, insurance or cars at this point. And I used to have a car dealership, so it wasn't a huge leap of faith for me to have to do that again. So uh, the other reason I was for doing the book was that I did want to take some credit in that it was 25 years ago that I had the idea. And I, uh, you know, as I tell the story in the book, I had gotten my butt beaten as a guy, a kid, a teenager, training for the Golden Gloves by a wrestler. And it was embarrassing. And I thought, gee, I thought I knew how to hook off the jab, and I didn't know anything. So here I am down in the sand, and I got an 80 kilo wrestler on top of me, and I'm realizing I don't know anything. And then when I was in Vietnam, a good buddy of mine from Chicago went to Bangkok, and he had seen, and I talk about it in the book, he had seen a match between a Thai boxer and an Indian wrestler. So when he came back and told us about that, it was like, whoa. You know, it, we were always debating, kicking it around. You know, could Muhammad Ali have beaten Bruce Lee? You know, all that kind of talk. So it just fed the fire at that point, and I never lost the idea. So here I am working for an ad agency in the late 80s, and my boss says to me, we got Takati beer. We don't have the whole account, but we got part of it, and I'm afraid of losing it. He said, I'm going to bring you in. He said, you got to come up with some ideas. I said, well, like, why? He said, I don't care. He said, but you better come up with something really wacky and off the edge because these people need to feel that we are creative. They think we're too pedestrian. They, we, they think we're just people who know how to create stuff that comes up on the shelves. So I came in and we talked. I came back to them with this idea among several. And look, it wasn't original. There was a guy named Bill Caton back in the late 40s and 50s who did this with boxing on TV for Vaseline hair time, and it became huge. So all I did was to take an idea, I stole an idea that had been successful for boxing and brought it back. And I, I said, but we're gonna do, the idea was we're gonna have all these different martial artists, and that's where I was going. It was an eight-man tournament, and it was pay-per-view. And out of that, I met, through all the research I did for that, I read an article, September of 89, called B.A.D. that a guy named Pat Jordan had written for Playboy. I was like, have any of you guys ever read that article? No, huh? Dave Meltzer has, but of course Dave Meltzer, God bless him, has read and been everywhere. Thank you, Dave. This article purported that the Gracies, the toughest man in the USA, lives in Torrance, California. I said, really? And he talked about the Gracie Challenge. A hundred thousand dollars. We'll put up our art against your art, and whoever wins walks away with a hundred grand. The problem was back in those days, nobody in the martial artists had a hundred thousand dollars, and actually, Jorge and Gracie didn't have a hundred thousand dollars, so nobody ever took him up on it. I eventually tracked him down and went out to meet him, and he was real excited about this new school that he had built because he had been teaching in his garage over at Redondo Beach, along with his brothers Hickson and Hoyce and Hoyler. And uh, he listened to my idea about the world's best fighter and he looked at me with blank eyes. He said, hey, you ever rolled? I said, no. I didn't want to tell him about my disastrous experience on the beach. But I went in the next night and rolled with him and I was stunned. That was my first exposure.
to Gracie Jiu Jitsu, any kind of a grappling. I wasn't a grappler, I didn't wrestle in high school. So it was stunning, and I actually became the first student at the academy. When I was sitting down with him, he was transferring over all the old students from the old cards from the, 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 the garage to this new school. And card number one was sitting on his desk, and he said, well, did you like this? I said, I'm blown away. He said, why, why don't you come in and roll? I said, okay. He said, you're actually going to be student number one. So there I was. And my lesson is at like 8 o'clock on a Tuesday night. Who's got the lesson at 9 o'clock? The man himself, John Milius. And I said to Horian, who's this guy? His face is familiar to me. I can't place him. He said, that's John Milius, the film director and screenwriter. I went, oh my God. Dirty Harry. Magnum Force. The dialogue, the all the great lines in Apocalypse Now. The line in Jaws, we need a bigger boat. That's John Milius. And John is a cool guy. I start to, you know, introduce myself to John, and I meet him, we hang out in Horian's office, and John loved to talk about Schwarzenegger and fighting and martial arts. He had wanted to be in the Marines, wanted to enlist, but he had asthma. So when he found out that I had been in the Marine Corps and gone to Vietnam, we hit it off. And that's the whole story, because now I was able, finally, after two years, to get Horian Gracie involved, and then the dog fight was to get somebody from TV. And I got turned down, as I said, in this little film clip you saw by HBO, by Showtime, by ESPN. Even lowly prime tickets said, call us when you got something else. I said, like what? They said, you got anything in the marital arts? I said, not. They said, well, we, we have a memo floating around that it said, if you bring us anything in the martial arts, we're supposed to show you the door. You know, kickboxing has failed on, 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 uh, on cable TV. So don't bring us anything in the martial arts. What else you got, kid? So it was a dog fight to get everybody together. And then I love to tell the story in the book that in the, the chapter 8, Sharks and Goldfish, there's an epigraph at the beginning of that chapter that says, a fishing rod is a pole with a hook at one end and a fool at the other. I was the fool. Because I'm calling up people and going, uh, you know, we're going to be doing this event and uh, there's no holes barred. And people were going, who? Who are you? Who are you with? Who do you represent? Uh, what did you say your name was again? Everybody blew me off the phone. So I dedicate the book, Is This Legal, to the 10 fighters who were gutsy enough, ballsy enough, brave enough to, to say yes to me. You gotta remember in those days, people didn't want to put their art up and have it exposed. In fact, one of the subtexts for the whole early shows that we did was, you bring your art in and let's see, let's, let's show the folkies out there what it is that you do. You say you've got a pressure point thing that you do in a seminar and you press this little spot here and you can make somebody go unconscious. Isn't that hypnosis? Oh, no, no, we learned this from, you know, from, from uh, the Sifu over in uh, Nepal. Okay, well, you got a guy that does that? Yeah, we do. He's in the next UFC. <laughs> so that was, that was the subcontext at that point for the show was if you did it and you was good at it, you're going to be coming in. I got the biggest kick about two or three weeks ago. Uh, Mike Chavello, I guess, was doing an interview down at 9MSN in Australia. And he's interviewing Frank Dukes. You guys know Frank Dukes? Okay. I've never met Frank Dukes, by the way. Never met him, never talked to him. But he's telling Mike, he said, you know, that event was actually inspired by me. <laughs> he says, not only that, he said, our Davey called me. He said... I, I told him, no, I was already retired at that point. He was about 37 when we did the first UFC. I never heard from him. But in all fairness, if he had called me by UFC 2, 3, or 4, and he said, look, I have been undefeated, Kumite, I'm the guy that the film is based on, I want to be in your event, he would have been in. I would have put his butt in in a heartbeat. And you know, the beauty of all this is, he, someone said to me this morning, look how primitive it was, and look at what it is now. The evolution has been stunning. Not only is it international, but look at the level of the fighters today. Look at John Jones. I mean, it's, it's incredible. But I point out to family and friends and anybody else who's been curious, the fighters started to evolve this darn thing right away. Between three and four, Kimo was over at the Gracie Academy begging Horian and Gracie, can I learn that Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu? You know, the guys were looking at the holes in their own training and their own skills and skill sets and saying, I better, I better go out and study this stuff. The fighters evolved it, and the rules evolved right away. You know, that no biting and eye gouging and no groin shots, before you know it, we had time limits, we had judges, we had weight classes, we had gloves. And I would try to tell the people in the press, you know, it's actually safer to be punching with a bare, bare fist. 
And of course, the reporters would look at me, Frank knows, the reporters look at me and go, now you're just trying to push that, that brutality, that, that human cockfighting angle. I said, no, no, no. I said, I'm going to quote Ken Shamrock. Shamrock once said, hitting a man in the head with a bare fist is like punching a bowling ball. You break your hand. If you wrap up that hand with tape, if I have Leon Tabs or Sam Solomon wrap up your hand, I put an old glove on you, you got yourself a padded club and you can punch with impunity. Bare fist, look what happened to Gerard Gordeau in that first seminal bout. Man, and his, his fist, his foot, he was in trouble. So it was, even by the time we were editing the rules, the media was still saying, this is bad. When I first went to Jim Coleman at Black Belt Magazine and said, Jim, we're gonna be doing this event. Jim said, Art, I only have one thing to say to you. He said, I really want you to consider this. He said, what you're doing is dirty fighting. I said, really? He said, this is bad for the kids of America. He said, it's bad for the martial arts. He said, don't you realize that we've got one of the greatest uh, child uh, su support systems? Is that after school, parents deliver their kids to a Taekwondo school, and between that time and dinner, they're being given respect. They're being taught uh, uh, a certain amount of athleticism and self-defense. I said, aren't they being taught to be invulnerable, be able to kick a punch? He said, what you're doing is gonna take it down to the gutter. So that's where we were, ladies and gentlemen. People back in the day said, what you're doing is not good. Today, I'm thrilled to see that it has evolved and grown and become so accepted. Although I was talking to Terry the other day, he said, I got on the phone with somebody, and he said, is this anything like Tough Man? This is somebody on TV, right, Terry? This year. This year. So here's somebody still saying, is this like our doors, Tough Man? Is this any, people, you know, there's still people out there, but I always say, look, if they're under 25, hey, they get this. They grew up on it. You get a guy, though, from 45 to 60, he grew up in the boxing paradigm, the, the professional wrestling paradigm. He relates to that. The UFC to him is still brutal. It's still human cockfighting in a way. It's strange. But imagine what it'll be like in 20 years. Imagine what the sport's going to be like in 20 years. John Millius used to say to me, Art, this is the new Excalibur. What you're doing is the creating a venue, an opportunity, and a place where the ultimate fighter, the ultimate warrior can be crowned. He said this could be huge. It was huge back in Pancration, back in ancient Greece. By the fourth time it was in the Olympics, Pancration and horse racing were the two most popular events in the ancient Greek Olympics. That's the story, and it's coming back again. So I'm so pleased and thrilled that you guys took your time from a very exciting International Fight Week and Fight Expo to be here to listen to an old man. But um, and also, also, if you have any questions, um, I, I'm willing to tell the truth. And I think most of it now is exposed in the book, so I just have to be, I have to be forthright and forthcoming. Anybody? Yes, sir. Well, that's a good question. Uh, I've got a couple of people, including Federico Lopenda, who says, why don't you to discuss UFC 7, which was such a seminal event, to bring in Marco Huas and to change the nature. He said, when are you going to write that? And i got to tell you something. If this book sells, it could be. We'll see. Yeah. Right. And that was the biggest live attendance gate at the time in Buffalo. Almost 10,000 people at the other time. Ladies and gentlemen, Charlie Anzalone, and this used to be, this used to be a, a felony offense. <laughs> But Charlie Anselone was the manager for Kevin Rozier at UFC 1 and is now the senior inspector with the Nevada State Athletic Commission. You'll see him prominently in the book. And uh, he, you're right, Charlie, that was the, the biggest live event at the odd. The Cobo Hall beat it later on. Cobo Hall beat it in Detroit. But, but I got to tell you, anytime you were up in New York State, the Canadian fans, they were great back in the day, they still are. Man, the Canadian family, right, Frank? Overall, oh, as yeah. you've traveled around the world, the Canadian fans love them. And they, I think the Aussies are now that same kind of crazy passion. Yeah, which I think is great. But uh, a lot of people also forget that we actually had New York approved for MMA, and then we lost it. And uh, that's another long story. And Bob Myrowitz, if he tells it, will have a, a different passion about it. But I'm hoping that one of these days that New York finally wakes up and realizes that they're losing revenue over to Connecticut and New Jersey. You know, uh, wake up, folks, to smell the coffee. This thing is arrived. It's real. Get down with it. Anybody else? Yes, sir. So we heard that that film clip was a little out of date, that you've actually been back to UFC since then. What is your relationship with them now? Well, you know, we, we cut that right before. And on October 14th, 
I got a phone call from Dana White. I had never spoken to Dana White. I had met Lorenzo on two previous occasions and have a lot of respect for him and his family. But I had never spoken to Dana. Dana calls me up and says, we just screened 20 years of fighting the history of the UFC over at the Red Rock Theater. You know, it's one of these uh, station casino properties. All the UFC employees saw it. And he said, it's your show. He said, man, that first hour, he says, it's Art Davey. He said, I want to invite you to be right next to the octagon at the UFC 167 and be our guest. He said, we're going to invite Horion and, and Campbell and Bob. So I went, and it was, it was pretty damn extraordinary. Number one, it was great to be back next to the octagon again. And to see the evolution, you know, I had not physically been at a UFC event, so to see the changes were exciting for me. And here I am sitting, I've got Horion Gracie on my right, with his young son next to him. I've got Campbell McLaren and, and his wife next on my left. Arnold Schwarzenegger is sitting right in front of me, and Leonardo DiCaprio is sitting right behind me. I was like a pig in that proverbial stuff. It was great. Thank you. Anybody else? Well, let's have some lunch. Thanks, ladies and gentlemen. Yes.